Okay. Good morning, everyone. You are very welcome to this um, late morning session that we have on um, groundwater natural resources assessment under climate change. You are all very, very welcome. Where I am in Uganda, it's currently afternoon, but I know where you are. It could be morning, so we will adopt the morning time. Uh, you are welcome to this session. The session that we are going into is a pretty interesting session, and we are looking at groundwater natural resources assessment under climate change. The intensification of precipitation in a warming world highlights the critical importance of water storage and the vital role played naturally by groundwater, the world's largest distributed store of fresh water in sustaining ecosystems and enabling climate resilient water supplies. This session that we are having late this morning welcomes submissions that address the direct impact of climate change on groundwater withdrawals for, for public water supplies, irrigation, as well as industry. Now the studies that are assessing conceptually and quantitatively interactions between groundwater and other components of the hydrosphere and bi biosphere under climate change, including conjunctive use of groundwater and surface water are, are of particular interest. And that's what this late morning's early afternoon session is going to focus on. I'll now invite my co-chair, Professor Richard Taylor, to now welcome the first speaker for this afternoon session. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rabina. Um, yes, just to uh, just a few housekeeping rules that um, each of our presenters will have 10 minutes for their presentation. We ideally would have each speaker speak a few minutes less or a couple of minutes less than 10 minutes just so that we can field some questions directly associated with the presentation. We will also have a plenary session uh, at the very uh, at the very end. Um, I uh, also remind the speakers that when they want to proceed with the next slide, they just need to uh, let the uh, uh, let us know to move to the next slide. Um, so the I will in I will welcome our first speaker to this session, Sun Woo Chang. Um, from the Korean Institute of Civil Engineering and Building Technology, uh, who will be uh, giving a presentation on the assessment of seawater intrusion affected by climate factors and anthropogenic activities, a case study from Korea. I'll hand the floor now over to Sun Woo Cheng. Thank you, Richard, and thank you, Robina. Um, and thank you for having me in this conference. Um, my name is Sonu Jang, and I'm a senior research in Korea Institute of Civil Engineering and Building Technology. I present today on behalf of my colleagues, Ilmun Jang, Hyosop Jo, and Songhun Hong. And this talk is going to describe how seawater intrusion is assessed in Korea. Next slide, please. Okay, coastal aquifers are known to be vulnerable to climate change and anthropogenic impacts. Therefore, managing coastal freshwater resources requires a detailed planning based on the scientific research outcome. Therefore, the goal of this study is to complete a comprehensive water management study to investigate the long-term change by climate factors as well as anthropogenic activities in fresh groundwater resources in coastal and island regions. Next slide, please. Okay. This slide shows a world map with a possible vulnerable coastal areas suffering seawater intrusion problems. Next slide, please. 
In recent years, population growth and land use change have increased the demand for fresh water in Korea. We believe that climate change effect have reduced the water availability in coastal areas. So the case study was conducted based on the field data for shallow unconfined aquifer of Jeju Island in the South Korea. And uh, it used the seawater intrusion monitoring network data and uh, numerically simulated data generated from multiple water resources management model. Next slide, please. Okay. So Jeju Island is the largest island in South Korea. Groundwater is an important freshwater resources for water supply in this area. And this island has limited number of surface water resources. Seawater intrusion into freshwater aquifers primarily occurs due to the difference in the density of seawater and groundwater. This small density difference can play a very significant role in controlling two types of Sea or intrusion process. The first one is the later intrusion, and the other is the upconing of seawater near pumping wells. And as you see the right figure in this slide, one of the most general research methods in this field is numerical simulation of transient density driven groundwater flow model to apply various type of climate and water use scenarios. However, in this study, we conducted a research by integrating GIS technique as well as numerical simulations. Next slide, please. So in this study, we conducted a vulnerability assessment of Jeju Island to seawater intrusion based on several years of collected groundwater level and the hydrogeological values. So left figure shows a flow chart of the process of garden method. The garden method is a numerical ranking method based on the overlay and index techniques. And it considers six hydro hydrogeological parameters and the name guarded is a combination of letters from the six parameters. Among the guarded parameters, the aquifer type, aquifer hydraulic conductivity, distance from shoreline, and thickness of the aquifer are assumed to be static, while the groundwater level and salinity data are assumed to be time-dependent parameters. So it reflects the stress on the aquifer. So you can see the big guarded spatial map in the result sections. In the map, the southwestern areas and eastern areas clearly indicated high vulnerability to the seawater intrusion. In the si right side of the slide, the figure shows the precipitation trend in the southwestern areas and it indicates a very low rainfall level in the 2013. And figure B shows a uh, groundwater monitoring data. It shows a very continuous decrease in groundwater level. And, uh, and figure C shows a very seasonal seawater intrusion since after 2017. So thus, we think that new vulnerable very new vulnerable areas could appear if this trend is projected in the future. This art research outcome was published in the World Journal last year. Next slide, please. Okay, recently in this area, extensive groundwater abstraction has been reported from the shallow aquifer in the northeast region of the Jeju Island. 
And the first figure shows that the future stress scenarios were simulated in response to increased pumping and change in the area recharge. In the second figure, the three-dimensional finite difference numerical ground order model was simulated using the mud flow family codes. It's called CWAT. The CWAT also used to delineate the current sewer flash or interface to quantitatively estimate the coastal freshwater ground water resources. And the result says that the seawater intrusion effect occurring throughout the landward movement of the witch. So the witch is seen is going to, you can see the mixing zone between the red and the the uh, blue regions. So that's the mixing drone. And it is also called a fresh water, salt water interface. So the research says that uh, it has us the current ground water use in the coastal aquifer did not induce any seawater intrusion. However, it will occur if the dry season continues for the next 10 years. So we obtained the predicted groundwater level and ion concentration from these numerical simulations in the middle of this slide figure. In the third figure, the numerically simulated groundwater level and salinity data was applied to the guided vulnerability assessment predictions. To the best of our knowledge, this is the first approach that the very the very first study to integrate the result of the detailed civil intrusion numerical approach with the driest phase the vulnerability assessment on a coastal ground water system. The assessment indicated that the current pattern of ground water use during the future dry season could cause very high vulnerability of this coastal aquifer to the civil intrusion. Okay, next slide, please. Recent field scale studies shows, recent field scale researches shows two major trends. The first one is acquiring a good field data and the second is the interdisciplinary collaboration among experts. We think our research followed these two major trends and we also think that the result can be considered as a good scientific tool to assess its sustainability for the climate change and anthropogenic activities with statistically proven data. Next slide, please. Okay, this is the last one. Okay. okay, thank you for your attention and please let me know if you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation, Sun Wu Chang. Um, I've been uh, looking in the Q and A for qu for questions, and there isn't a specific one that I can uh, identify at the moment. I think I will take the chair's uh, privilege and um, and ask you what strategies uh, may have been considered in light of your research. For instance, might there be a possibility of alternating abstraction so that during the dry season where the risk is highest you might pump groundwater from wells that are within the interior of the island and then during the rainy season you could alternate and um, have abstraction done closer to the coastal zone. Um, a strategy like this has been employed in, uh, in Brighton here in the United Kingdom and I'm just wondering whether this is um, a, an idea of alternating the abstraction from the coastal zone to an inland zone, whether that's an option to consider here to adapt. Okay, so do we have a time to answer? Yeah, just a, just a few, uh, just a minute or two, just well, a minute perhaps, just whether you think the idea of alternating abstraction from the inland area to the coastal area with seasons might reduce the risk during dry season uh, uh, intrusion. So can you 
Tell I your think, question in an you, easier word. You know what, I think what we'll do some, we'll do, I think we'll address this perhaps in the plenary session and see whether there are other thoughts on, on this matter now. We'll need to move to our next speaker. Okay, okay. so thank you, and we'll, we'll address this in the plenary, okay? Um, okay. Rabina, could you introduce our, uh, our next speaker? Yes, please. Um, I welcome our next speaker, Simon Craig. Simon Craig is our next speaker. Simon is an MSc student from IHE Delft Institute for Water Education in the Netherlands. And he will be sharing with us his research on drivers of groundwater salinity and potential for freshwater abstraction on a semi-arid coral limestone island in Sri Lanka. Simon, you are very welcome. Thank you for the introduction, Robina. And greetings, everyone. As Romita mentioned, I'll be presenting on the drivers of groundwater salinity and potential for freshwater abstraction on a semi-arid coral island in Sri Lanka. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Delft Island is located off of the northwestern coast of Sri Lanka and has a population of approximately 5,000 persons. Their transient population, which are the tourists, tend to come in on frequently on the island. And there are no surface water capacity on the island. It's all, it's all saline and they depend highly on groundwater reserves. Now with the growth in their transient population, as well as long-term sea level rise, we see a further stress on their, so their groundwater reserves that are already becoming saline. And thus the research objectives are to evaluate and explain the distribution of fresh and saline waters on the island through geophysical surveying and hydrochemical analysis, as well as to evaluate the abstraction potential of their groundwater reserves through numerical modeling. Next slide, please. The hydrogeological setting of the island is a karstic, karstic limestone island that is overlain in the western areas by yellow and brown sand, as well as in the northeastern areas. On the fringes, we have beach sands. Now, the fresh water occurs as a thin lens overlying saline water on the island. And due to the karstic limestone, all wells on the island are hand dug to a depth of approximately 2 to 2.5 meters and at maximum down to 3 meters. Next slide, please. As a result, we decided to use the methods of geophysical surveying as well as collecting water samples along the island for hydrochemistry and isotope analysis. Next slide, please. Now, the vertical electrical soundings, the results showed the typical decrease in resistivity with depth profile on the island. And this is typical when, when you transfer from fresh waters to saline waters. From the interpretation of the soundings, we've noticed that the thickness of the freshwater lens, it varies up to about 2.2 meters, and at the thickest, it was down to about three meters. These profiles that we have on the screen are mainly in the yellow and brown sands and on the beet sands that we had on the island. As you would expect, in areas where you have coral limestone, it would be hard to perform vertical electrical soundings due to the inability to put the, um, the electrical stokes into the ground. Next slide, please. A cross section from the southwest to the northeast, and we go through um, one of the surface ponds on the island, we see the differences in the thickness of the freshwater lens as we go across the island. And as you would realize, the vertical electrical soundings also show that the fresh water, the surface waters are fully saline on the island. Next slide, please. From our isotope analysis and hydrochemical analysis, we, dis we did a plot of the chloride concentration in most millimoles per liter, as well as the delta 18, delta O18, um, composition on the island. The results highlighted preferential recharge during the wet season. In our surface water samples, we saw the effects of evaporation as well as seawater mixing. 
as we move to the next slide, then we decided to look at a spatial distribution of our chloride concentration and our delta deuterium content. And to the left of the screen, we see a distribu our spatial distribution of our groundwater samples. It is highlighted that we there are more rainwater dominant on the, in the groundwater samples, and there are few instances of salinization dominant and mixed evaporation, mixed um, dominance of evaporation and salinization. To the right of the screen, we look at the surface water samples, and we see that there's a variation between all types where we have rainwater, evaporation, salinization, and the mix of all of them in our spatial distribution of chloride concentration. Next slide, please. Then we decided to combine the results from our vertical electrical soundings as well as of our hydrochemical analysis to perform our conceptual model of the freshwater lens on the island. Please note that this cross section is completed on the western part of the island and it runs from north to south, which will be left to right on the screen. Based on this, we estimated our recharge rates and flow direction. The lines and arrows that you would see in the upper part would show the extent of the freshwater lens based on the recharge that we would be expecting from our calculations. It was also noticed in our hydrochemical analysis that there was some nitrate concentration due to um, septic, septic tanks um, in the ground. In one area, due to the, we had a bit, we didn't have sufficient data to give a good extent on the freshwater lens in that area, and thus it's highlighted in light blue. Next slide, please. This slide is where we performed our the abstraction potential on the island, and we used mud flow and the seaward package with the density-driven flow. Now, to the left of the screen, we have point abstractions, and on to the right of the screen, we have distributed abstractions. On the, to, due to the lack of information on how much water has been extracted by the residents, we use the WHO guidelines for the the number of the amount of water a person would use on the island and then apply this to the abstraction rates on the in the wells. To the left of the screen, we see upconing in the upconing in the Manatharai well field that is in the northern part of the island. Right. And as we move away from the coast, we still see instances of upconing. Whereas when we change the distributed abstractions, we see that further away from the coast, there is less upconing happening. But as we are closer to the coast, we see more of an instance of lateral saltwater intrusion occurring. Next slide, please. The main messages that we got from our numerical modeling was that the, the island, the aquifer, has low potential for abstractions from point sources, as opposed to distributed abstractions. And the location, if you were to choose to do distributed abstractions, you would decide to move further away from the coast, which would be further impacted if you have rising sea levels when we have losing of the shoreline as well. And the sensitivity analysis highlighted that the general thickness of the freshwater lens is most sensitive to changes in our dispersion factors and recharge. Keep in mind that many of these these, um, these values were estimated based on averages that we had on the island. Next slide, please. In conclusion, we came to the fact that alternative means must be put in place to meet the demands of the current and growing population on the island. Additionally, we saw that rising sea levels would affect the, the extent of the freshwater lens. It is also extrapolated that in cases of when you have cases of reduced rainfall and combined with rising sea levels, it is possible that there will be no fresh water um, lens on the island for the residents to have to extract their groundwater. And thus, to mitigate these effects, we, we suggest that an artificial recharge system be put in place and a change to more for horizontal abstraction profile. It, has, it is noted that on the island, there is already a reverse osmosis plant that they've started to put in 
to start to mitigate the effects that they're already seeing, as well as there's been some experimental techniques on the island that deal with solar powered evaporation type desalinators. Next slide, please. And that's about it for now. Should you have any questions, please feel free to give them. Thank you, Simon, for your presentation. We did go to the 10 minutes, so I'm afraid we're going to have to field some of those questions in the um, uh, uh, in the plenary session at the end in light of keeping on time. Uh, but there's some good questions that are in that are in the chat, and I'll put some of them to you um, uh, while the, the next speaker is presenting. Um, Rubina, could you please introduce our next speaker? Yes, please. Um, our next speaker is Long Than Tran, who is a postdoctoral researcher from the Department of Water Resources Engineering um, in Chula Long Thorn University in Thailand. And he's going to present to us his research work on the impact of climate change towards groundwater use and mitigation in the upper central plain basin of Thailand. So Long Than Tran, you are very welcome. Uh, thank you for your introduction, uh, introduction introduce me. Yes, uh, my name is Long Han Trans. I come from uh, Water Resources Engineering Department. Yeah, today uh, I would like to present my uh, research on the impact of the climate change towards the groundwater use and the mitigation in the upper central plain basins of the Thailand. Next slide, please. So my content is uh, my parts first study area of the yeah, problem of the crowds. And the second is the bias correction rainfall data in the study area. And the third one, the impact the climate change towards the water levels. And the fourth, the mitigation measure through the recharge well. And the fifth is the conclusion. Next slide, please. So the problem is the study area is the upper central plane of the Central plant basin of the Thailand. Uh, the problem is the under the water stretch in the drought years, in the upper central plant basin of Thailand, the excessive extraction groundwater have uh, has uh, dramatically increased to meet the high irrigation water demand during the dry season. Uh, it caused the hotspot, pre hotspot, uh, hotspot in the one with the uh, six meters uh, groundwater decrease from 20 years before and groundwater keeping decrease and the hotpot too with the moss uh, crisis because the uh, more pumping in here and the groundwater decrease is uh, 10 meter depth in the dry season uh, and the uh, hotpot spray in the industry uh, is the groundwater decrease for meter depth uh, in beginning with the season uh, dry season so the my, my study my research to uh, assess the groundwater use in the study area and uh, and um, uh, and to, see, uh, to assess the groundwater uh, use and the suitable mitigation under climate change in the upper central plain basin of the Thailand. So next slide please. Next slide, please. So uh, based on the good performance uh, of the GGM for the whole Thailand country. So MRI and uh, IPSL have a good performance close to the observed ones. So I extract the data and compare with the rainfall in the regions. And I found that uh, the IPSL uh, have the uh, increase the groundwater, uh, increase the rainfall in the upstream and decrease in the, the provincial in the downstream uh, 10%. And however, in the total of the region is the, the rainfall uh, increase very small a little bit, uh, but the worst case is go to the come to the MRI, uh, MRI and uh, MRI RCP two by six and RCP uh, MRI RCP eight point five is the worst case. So I project uh, the good, the best case and the worst case to to check the uh, rain, uh, rainfall in the climate in the study area this region. So you see, is the rainfall is. Uh, is going keep going decrease in the next 20 years based on the the uh, scenario of the crazy shame. Next slide, please. 
So after the I use the uh, the rainfall of the three GCM and I use the pumping rate as the current ratio is the contents yield ratio because the the groundwater use we, we miss contents yield we miss the uh, the surface water based on the the dam storage in the surface. So if the lack of the with uh, less rainfall, so they will rely on the groundwater. And we, we pump more the groundwater and less recharge in the rainfall from the rainfall. So the groundwater keep going down in uh, next 20 years from three scenarios. Next slide, please. Yes, so to uh, mitigate the, is the chaos, uh, is the problem without the mitigation recharge for the uh, region. So because the limit time, so I just uh, focus on the example on the mitigation counter recharge in trial or run at the hotspot too. Um, and actually, actually in the existing area, they have two alternatives of the uh, mitigation recharge. So first is they inject 500 small well during the wet season. So they, they collect the small pond and then inject, let they, they uh, gravity uh, recharge to the well. And but uh, this case also back the groundwater increase 0 0.3 meters uh, for the year whole year. And alternative two, they make the another national pay recharge. So they put the water to the with the 550 million kilometer in three months uh, in West season from the August to October in the in the upper in the irrigation area is the upper of the hotspot too. So because the the area is not missed to the hotspot too, so the groundwater is not uh, increased much. So it's still increased zero point three meter uh, for for next twenty year. So to to meet the target groundwater level, meet the target of groundwater level, uh, re recover the groundwater level as the normal in the previous uh, in the normal, normal year. So I simulate that artificial recharge on to put into the uh, hotspot too, and they have 12 recharge side. So which side they have 4,500 uh, 4, kilometer per day. So in check to the hotspots, and we might it improve the groundwater back to the target groundwater level. It's the it back uh, groundwater level increase to five meter F. Uh, next slide, please. So I would like to conclude my research. The rainfall of the GCM uh, MRI decreased 10 percent for whole region in next 20 years. The rainfall of IPS else will increase 10 percent upstream and decrease that 5 percent in the downstream. Um, the groundwater level tend to decrease based on the rainfall decrease. So the groundwater also decrease in the three scenarios. And the existing mitigation project are low effect on the governor recharge since the coverage area are large. And the uh, artificial recharge pond with the high volume and focus area in the hospital can assist the water level increase back to normal uh, with five meter depth increase. We cover the area of 275 kilometers square uh, from 2020 to 2014. Next slide, please. So I would like to thank to the project uh, associate, associate professor Kun Tan and project for the groundwater study in the upper Chavaya plan joint research study with the GGR on under NRCT, uh, DSIR SPAHES research program on water management. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you for your attention. Yeah, thank you. Um, we have time perhaps for uh, just a couple of very quick questions that were asked. Uh, um, one is, could you clarify which bias correction uh, procedure you use for the rainfall? Uh, I use the rescale bias correction and gamma gamma. Okay. Um, and there was a question from uh, uh, Mohammed Khalifa who was asking about uh, when you were talking about some of the managed aquifer recharge and it, what um, uh, what were the kind of infiltration rates that you were considering and how did they affect groundwater levels? Is there practical experience with these or is it hypothetical? Uh, they uh, they have the 
that's inside in the few side that uh, this is small side is the 12 kilometer per day they have a practice and uh, the pond side they also uh, testify, testify already with the 4000 kilometer per day okay the, the, all right the volume by phone yeah thanks very much for that there's more questions yeah. that we'll cover in, in okay, the plenary. Thank so okay for thanks very much for that um rabina perhaps could you move ahead and introduce our next speaker Yes, please. Um, our next speaker is Mba, Mbambi Nyanfi. He's a Master of Science student from IH, IHE Delft Institute for Water Education. And Mambi is currently in Zimbabwe. Um, he will be presenting to us his um, research on comparative assessment of small water storage structures in semi-arid regions considering hydroclimatic, geological, and socioeconomic contexts. So, Mambi, you are very welcome. Okay, thank you very much and uh, good day to you all. So I will present my research findings on the topic entitled a comparative assessment of small water storage structures in semi-arid regions considering hydroclimatic geological and socio-economic context. Next slide, please. May you go through, yes, all the objectives. Okay, so semi-arid uh, areas are characteristic of low rainfall, which is uh, unreliable and with uh, high evaporation rates. So in those areas, uh, small water storage structures are widely used to capture surface runoff. So the main objective of this research was to assess the feasibility of the different small water storage structures, namely micro reservoirs, sand dams, and sand rivers as a function of hydroclimatic, geological, and socioeconomic context. So the, the study was based on an intensive literature study on storage, sedimentation, water quality, costs, and management in, in semi-arid areas of uh, sub-Saharan Africa, which are highlighted uh, by red dots on the next map on the next slide. Yes, thank you. So, a region called Tete, which is in Mozambique, was uh, used for mapping the potential sites of uh, these structures and also for the quantitative uh, storage assessments. Next slide, please. And then for mapping, the parameters that were used were slope, the geology, and the stream order. And these were based on the record recommendations from the intensive literature review. Next slide, please. So the findings, the mapping, the findings on uh, mapping, uh, as an example, we have uh, a result for the sand dams. So we showed a 64% match with the non-sites. So from the mapping results, uh, it shows that GIS and remote sensing tools can be used to show the potential of an area for siting these structures. And then the mismatch uh, can be attributed to the wrong siting of the sand dams which when compared to the non-sites were shown to be either silted or they acted as open surface reservoirs. So another possible explanation could be on the method of construction. So the ma main method of construction that was used was uh, constructing the structures on a single phase, which uh, is opposed to constructing the recommended uh, method of constructing in phases. 
So the mapping procedure was also done for the Seine, Seine rivers and also for the micro reservoirs with the different uh, results. Next slide, please. And then in terms of uh, the quantitative assessments on storage, we have uh, an example of Chakalanga Centum, which uh, showed that uh, evaporation in a Seine river would, uh, in a Centum, would okay up to the extinction depth. And then the extractions, what is mainly available for a few months after cessation of the rain, and then the rest of the period would be dry. So if there are many users, water users on the structure, you have uh, a few months of water storage. So a similar trends were also observed for micro reservoir and uh, which are slightly different from uh, Seine rivers. So next slide, please. And then the findings from the intensive uh, literature review showed that uh, small water storage structures generally have a small storage, but they could be of use in uh, semi-arid areas. So centums have uh, relatively less storage as compared to micro reservoirs, but when they are sited uh, properly and the, the construction method is uh, building in stages, you achieve more storage, which is uh, different from micro reservoirs, which have a slightly larger storage, but then a large amount, a large volume of water is lost to evaporation. And then for Seine rivers, generally they have a larger storage, provided that uh, the river is wider and uh, deeper with, uh, with a flat river base, which is uh, cost sand stored. And then the main challenge with these structures is maintenance. So it was coming out from most of the studies that uh, structures are implemented, but then there is no maintenance or there is less community involvement in uh, maintenance. Next slide, please. So in a conclusion, uh, remote sensing and geographic information system tools can be used in planning stages to map the potential of an area for constructing uh, centums and micro reservoirs or for developing uh, potential water abstraction points along a sand river. So these structures are mainly affected by bacterial contamination with the micro reservoirs being more vulnerable followed by uh, centums. So it depends if the with the nature of the centum, if it's mature, you would have uh, less uh, contamination. And then management is, an impo is important for the success of these uh, structures. And then as a recommendation for centums and micro reservoirs, there is a need to make sure to terrace the upstream so as to reduce the erosion rates, which have uh, an impact on siltation, which also impacts the quality of the water stored. So thank you. Next slide. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation, Lambi. Uh, uh, that was very good. Um, I haven't seen any specific questions at the moment in the Q&A. Perhaps I, we have time for just uh, for, uh, one, and I'll, again, I'll use Chair's privilege in asking you one directly. Okay. Um, in the design of the different structures, you mentioned yes. problems of maintenance. And I was wondering, perhaps you could explain a little bit more in a, a bit more detail, what assumptions yes. have been made into the design of these structures and to what extent there is um, community involvement. So for instance, are these based on indigenous knowledge, basic local knowledge, or are these 
we'll call them engineering structures that are being maybe imposed from outside. And to what degree was their community participation? Was that something you were able to get a handle on for each of these de uh, design structures? Oh, okay. Thank you, Richard. Uh, in terms of uh, maintenance, uh, what was coming out from the literature review was that uh, the way the, the project is implemented will determine its uh, maintenance. If the community is uh, involved at all stages during the planning, during siting, uh, and also during a gathering of uh, local materials like stones and uh, gravel that are to be used for construction. If the community feels they are, they, they are involved in all those stages, it becomes easier for them to maintain the structure. And like when uh, the engineers come with the design and uh, maybe share with the community their plans okay so, so that would, yes we'll, we'll, we'll have to move on in the interest of time mommy but the, thank you okay. for that thank you for your reply um okay thanks. and we'll cover we'll cover more questions in the in the plenary at the end um okay, thank you th so thank you again i'll now move to my co-chair um robina robina i'm going to ask you to introduce the next speaker and then could you, um, could you manage the questions at the end? I, I do hope there'll be time at the end for some questions. Okay. It's over to you, Rubina. Okay, thank you very much. Um, the next speaker is actually um, Richard Taylor, uh, who is my co-chair. So Richard Taylor is a professor of hydrogeology from the University College London in the United Kingdom. Professor Taylor will be sharing his um, research findings on groundwater recharge and the amplification of rainwater extremes under climate change. So Professor Taylor, you're welcome. Thanks very much, Rubina. Um, so the main argument that I'm going to make here in a few minutes in this conference is that the ampl amplification of precipitation extremes under climate change in many environments serves to increase groundwater recharge. Next slide, please. There is substantial uncertainty in projecting precipitation in a warming world, where, when, how much spring is going to fall or snow is going to fall in different environments. And indicated in part by the, the slide that you can see here, one consistent observed impact, this is nothing to do with models, I mean, although models are part of the evidence base that inform this, based on observations alone, we are seeing how in a warming world, there is a shift towards fewer light precipitation events and more frequent heavy pre uh, precipitation. And that this transition, which is sort of indicated in the distributions you can see here, fewer light precipitation events and a greater number of extreme precipitation. This is most pronounced in the tropics. And part of the reason for that is that the, um, uh, something known as the Klaus's Capelon relation and the idea that there's an expen exponential relationship between air temperature and saturation vapor pressures. So two degrees in, of warming in the tropics has a much greater impact on the saturation vapor pressure than it does in, say, in London, where I'm sitting now. Um, so there is, I guess the point being, this amplification of precipitation extremes is most pronounced in the tropics. That's a take home message. Next slide, please. So what we've seen in, from research that goes back now more than two decades is that in the humid tropics, we say observed groundwater level rises and also in the chemistry of the water, it's, of the groundwater itself, the stable isotope ratios of oxygen and hydrogen, these trace recharge the heavy rainfall events exceeding 10 millimeters per day. Uh, ne well, next slide, but sorry, there's a little bit of motion. Yeah. So, and the way that this, this tracing is done is that heavy rainfall in the tropics is controlled not by temperature the way it is at higher latitudes, 
but more on something known as the amount effect. So heavier rainfalls are, are more depleted in, their, um, in the heavy isotopes. And using that signal, one is able to trace heavy rainfall to um, preferentially to groundwater sampled at these locations. Next slide. When we then looked at uh, a record that was uh, in excess of uh, half a century in semi-arid Tanzania, and we looked at the relationship between rainfall and recharge, we, saw, we found that recharge occurs disproportionately, but also episodically from extreme rainfall. And that extreme rainfall in this environment in central semi-arid Tanzania is, an, is associated with generating ephemeral stream flow. And what we found is that seasons of particularly pronounced rainfall, so those extreme years of rain, uh, seasons of rainfall, disproportionately in a non-linear way, as indicated by the upper plot here, lead to substantial groundwater recharge. So for instance, in the top right corner where there's a recharge, of, a season of recharge, this accounts, this recharge event, which occurred over a five month period uh, during the greatest El Nino event of the 20th century, accounted for 25% of all the recharge received over a 55 year period. The other interesting thing that we noted there is that the episodic recharge results from heavy rainfall associated with ENSO, the El Nino Southern Oscillation. And that's important because what it tells us is that recharge is in part predictable, those heavy rainfall events producing recharge, but also cyclical, which means you Although it may be episodic, you have some faith, if you want to call it that, and evidence that it's going to occur again. Next slide, please. So we then looked more broadly across tropical Africa, looking at long-term piezometric records and rainfall data. And it confirmed a number of points made in Tanzania. One, that there is a bias to recharge occurring from heavy rainfall. What do I mean by this by it? It wouldn't surprise anyone that heavier rainfalls produce more recharge. But the point is more than that. It means heavy rainfalls disproportionately contribute to uh, recharge. So that a higher fraction of the rainfall event during a heavy one or a season of rainfall contributes more recharge than um, a, the, the same fraction of a lighter or lower seasonal rainfall. We also notice that there is strong episod episodicity. So it occurs every once in a while, not every year in drylands. And also we confirm that other links to large scale climate controls. And last, we also confirmed uh, the importance of focused recharge. Focused recharge occurring via leakage from surface waters, be it ephemeral streams, ephemeral ponds, or sometimes even perennial streams and ponds. Next slide, please. In a review of 200 recharge studies across Africa now, most recently we found that there's a non-linearity in the relationship between long-term average rainfall and long-term average recharge, meaning that um, greater, uh, higher rainfall, long-term higher rainfall leads to disproportionately greater recharge. And this is evidence from 200 studies across the African continent. Next slide, please. We've also traced the composition of tropical gro of groundwaters across the tropics to a bias to depleted isotopic signatures associated with extreme rainfall. Next slide, please. Now, looking globally, we found nonlinear trends in groundwater storage to traced by GRACE satellites. And again, non-linearity in these trends is associated with the episodic nature of groundwater replenishment from extreme annual or seasonal precipitation. And the clearest examples are observed in dryland environments, including the California Central Valley and the Great Artesian Basin in Australia. Next slide, please. So, the intensification of precipitation driven by climate change amplifies groundwater recharge in many environments. Yet it also increases the intensity and duration and frequency of floods and droughts. Groundwater thus becomes a hydrological source of fresh water to adapt to climate change, especially in the tropics. Next slide. 
So rapid extreme, the rapid transmission of heavy rainfalls through soils as recharge is inconsistent with models employing matrix defined infiltration capacities and the Richards equation and reflects the presence of structures like macropores, making groundwater more vulnerable to contamination than perhaps we previously had thought. Next slide or next. Most large scale models of recharge don't represent focus recharge, which is a dominant recharge pathway in drylands and therefore undermines the validity of the recharge projections in these dryland environments. Thank you very much, that's it. Okay, thank you very much, Professor Taylor, for the presentation. Um, I was trying to check and see if there are some questions. Yes, um, they, they, there's, uh, maybe I'll start by using my privilege as well as co-chair. Uh, Professor Taylor, I'm wondering when you're talking of heavy rainfalls as having, um, you know, great implication for groundwater recharge, how heavy is heavy rainfall in quantitative terms if Thank we are looking at millimeters per day? Yeah. Thank you How for that. The, yeah, the IPCC um, has defined this and again defined it most recently in the upcoming sixth assessment report. And they define it on a daily basis, heavy rainfall is greater than 10 millimeters per day. Okay. Now, okay. other people, when we begin to move to monthly or seasonal or annual rainfall, people generally will use values within a percentile. Commonly, people will look at 90th and 95th percentiles, but actually many studies end, ended up, end up defining extreme or heavy rainfalls in their own way. And that's something you should look for in a paper to see what percentile people have used to define that. I, I will intervene now as co-chair and say that we've run out of time associated with my presentation and we should move on. Um, and I'll just ask Rubina, could you introduce the next speaker? Is that all right? Okay, yes. Thank you very much. Um, our next speaker is, um, let me hope I pronounce their name properly, but please forgive if I don't. Our next speaker is Sajay Greenvinsky. Um, he is a professor from Moscow State University in Russia, and he will be presenting to us um, his research on the impact of modern climate changes on the groundwater recharge in the European part of Russia. Professor Green Greenesvik, you are very welcome. Sorry, the name is pretty difficult to pronounce. Thank you very much. Professor. Good day, uh, dear colleagues. I'd like to present uh, the results of our research uh, of modern climate changes on the groundwater recharge in the European part of Russia. Next slide, please. Uh, the study area in the western part of Russia from the Black Sea in the south to the White Sea in the north, where the natural climate conditions change uh, from semi-arid to boreal humid. Long-term data from more than 20 weather stations show clear trends in increasing air temperature and the decreasing wind speed since mid-1980s. Since mid, since mid At the same time, on the, on the right of the screen, as you can see that there are no clear trends in task of changes in precipitations and air humidity. Next slide, please. The detailed the detailed analysis of modern climate changes was made by the comparison of mean annual and seasonal meteorological characteristics for two periods, the historical period of relatively stable climate until the end of 80s and the modern period uh, of changing climate. We also analyzed latitudinal differences in climate change using long-term data from 22 weather stations. The next few graphs uh, show the main patterns of absorbed uh, climate change. First, we see a predominant increase in mean annual precipitation in the whole region up to 50 millimeters per year, excluding uh, some thousand regions. Next, please. Latitudinal differences of model precipitation changes are visible at the seasonal level. In the south, there is no there is increase in winter and summer precipitation and a decrease in autumn values. But in the south, we see a completely opposite pattern. 
Tas nekas An average air temperature also increased in the whole region with a maximum changes in the center and in the north up to the 1.4 degrees. Uh, temperature have increased in all seasons, but it is important that the maximum increase is going to occur in winter up to three degrees. Uh, next, please. This slide shows a significant, significant decrease in surface annual wind speed in the modern period by more than one meter per second. Next, please. And this wind speed decreasing is relatively uniform in all seasons. Next, please. We also analyzed the change in air humidity which showed only its small annual and seasonal variations by one to 3%. Next, please. Since we see significant climate changes it is in modern period, there is a question how they affected uh, the water balance processes and groundwater recharge. And are there any latitudinal differences in the, of the impact of climate change? We used uh, the simulation of groundwater recharge to analyze these questions. The groundwater recharge model consists of two blocks. Next, please. The first model block, the Sorbal code, described in these papers, simulates the water energy balance of the Earth's surface and in the upper soil and calculates uh, surface evaporation and runoff, thinking, taking into account uh, snow accumulation and melting as well as uh, so freezing and towering. Long-term data from 1960 to 2018, as well as soil and vegetation parameters typical for the region were used as input data. Just next, please. The results of the first simulation stage, such as daily seepage to the soil and potential evapotranspiration were used as input data for the second block of the model, the well-known called hydros which simulates and saturated flow in Vado zone with root water uptake. Next, please. The summary, the summary model results are long-term annual and seasonal averages of surface runoff, evapotranspiration, and groundwater recharge calculated by daily, uh, just by daily simulated values. Next, please. This average of, of water balance were compared over historical and modern periods so we can estimate how climatic changes uh, of annual precipitation and other meteorological characteristics were transformed into changes in actual evapotranspiration, surface runoff, groundwater recharge, and uh, soil water storage. Next, please. The results of simulation show uh, that modern climate changes lead to decreasing of mean annual surface runoff in the southern regions and to, its, it, and to its increasing in the north. And the best correlation between changes of surface runoff and precipitation shows uh, the main reason for this. The different point colors uh, in the figures here and below represent simulation results for four different landscape conditions, middle and forest on sandy and uh, low soils. Next, please. These two figures uh, show a comparison of the average intraannual runoff for the historical the black line and modern red line periods. Both in the north and in the south, uh, there is a significant decrease in the runoff of spring floods and an increase in the winter runoff due to towers. Next, please. Despite the general increase in air temperature, the model results did not show the corresponding increase in actual evapotranspiration. Moreover, it decreases in the center of the region. The next please. This is due to the opposite influence of two main reasons. On the one hand, an increase in precipitation and air temperature leads to an increase of plant transpiration and the best correlation between changes in simulated transpiration and absorbed precipitation uh, show this. But on the other hand, the absor an absorbed decrease in wind speed leads to a significant, 
a significant decrease in surface and soil evaporation, despite of air temperature rising. Next, please. Finally, uh, simulated modern changes in annual groundwater recharge are different in latitude. In the south, groundwater recharge has not changed, but increased in the north by 20, 60 millimeters per year, which is up to 50% for some landscapes. The, these changes in the recharge correlate with modern changes of the total aridity index, which reflects the combined influence of uh, precipitation and other meteorological characteristics. Next, please. Also, uh, the increase on, in annual uh, recharge in the central and in the north of the region is primarily due to two reasons. First, there is increase in winter precipitation. And the uh, upper figure just, just confirms this. The second- S Sergey, we have one minute, okay? Okay. The second is a decrease in the soil freezing depths caused by an increase in winter temperature, which leads to higher soil, soil infiltration in the cold season. Next, please. So the main conclusions of presented research are the following. Despite the, despite the, despite the significant increase in air temperature, simulated groundwater recharge in the southern region did not change but they have increased in the central and northern regions of Europe and part of Russia. There are two main reasons of this phenomenon. Firstly, uh, the observed increase in air temperature is compensated by a decrease in wind speed. So there was no significant increase in evapotranspiration. Secondly, the observed increase in air temperature and precipitation in the winter period is the main reason of the increase in groundwater recharge. Since these climate changes leads to an increase in the water uh, infiltration just get into the soil at the season when there, when there is no evapotranspiration. And uh, such analysis uh, of the modern climate changes impact on the processes of water balance transformation make it possible to predict them more confidently in the future. Next please. Thank, thank you, Sergey. Thank you for your attention. Okay. We th thank you. We'll move um, to our final speaker, and then we'll cover some of these topics again in the plenary. Um, uh, Rabina, could you introduce our final speaker in this session? Yes, please. Um, our final speaker for this session number three is um, Robert Reineke. Robert is an acting deputy director, International Center for Water Resources and Global Change in UNESCO. Robert is going to present to us this afternoon changes of groundwater recharge at different global warming levels, a global scale multimodal ensemble approach. Dr. Reinike, you are welcome. Thank you so much for the introduction and thank you very much also to the last two speakers for the great presentation already on groundwater recharge. Fits perfectly into my topic. Uh, I'm going to talk about changes in groundwater recharge based on a model ensemble of global hydrological models and the difficulties in modeling groundwater recharge changes on such large scales. Next slide. Billions of people rely on groundwater as an accessible source for drinking water and irrigation, especially in times of drought, as already point, uh, pointed out by Richard. This is, its importance will likely increase with the changing climate, and it is unclear, however, to what extent climate change will globally impact groundwater systems and thus the availability of, uh, availability of this important resource. Groundwater recharge is a central indicator for groundwater availability, but projections vary and it is hard to measure and even harder to simulate at large scales. It is a water flux that is especially hard to estimate as uncertainties in the water balance accumulate and possibly large areas in the water balance add up. And this is especially true for dry regions. Next slide. In this talk, I'm presenting a global scale uh, results study uh, based on, as I said, multi-model ensemble approach incorporating eight global hydrical models and four global circulation models to show the impact of global warming on global groundwater recharge. All the models can be seen in the upper right corner. 
pre-industrial and current, so at one degree global warming groundwater recharge are compared with recharge for different global warming le levels as a result of different representation concentration pathways. As a res uh, all results show in, shown in this talk, talk originate from a manuscript, which is currently uh, under review in Hess. Uh, the preprint is open access, so if you're interested in further details, uh, please be sure to check it out. Um, Due to the time limitation, I can't go into too much details explaining the methodology, but the general idea is to calculate in an ensemble mean around the time a certain GCM reaches a stabilized warming level under a certain concentration pathway. This point in time is, of course, different for each RCP GCM combination and then involves um, a huge time, uh, time of calculation to actually get the results. Um, in this presentation, I would like to focus on the next figure. Next slide, please. Um, what you can see here is the difference in mean groundwater recharge between the current warming of one degree to a potential warming of three degree. I haven't shown uh, percentage changes here, as in some regions you have close to zero groundwater recharge and then calculating the relative recharge uh, is quite challenging and doesn't give you uh, so good results. Uh, what you can see is actually um, quite consistent to also the last uh, presentation that we have increases in ground for the recharge in, in ex for example, Northern Europe, and we see decreases in several regions as for example expected in the, in the Med region. Um, but these results need to be taken with a huge grain of salt. This is a simple model mean, and in some regions, not all models of the ensemble agree on the statistical significance of the results, as shown in the next slide. Um, I would like you to focus on the uh, lower right figure, so this is F. It's basically the same figure you saw before, but now I've highlighted the statistical uh, significant regions suggested by a statistical test, uh, which really show significant change in recharge in the large agreement in between the models. And as you can see, results suggest that the uncertainty rate is large and predictions with confidence can only be made for specific regions worldwide. As you can see, there's only uh, the Mississippi uh, Basin highlights up, for example, or parts, uh, parts of Europe as the, in decreases of recharge. This is because a lot of these models actually are not uh, consistent on what they predict will change. We investigated further how the inclusion of uh, important processes like dynamic vegetation, so how vegetation changes with CO2 level is not implemented in most global models. We assess that in the page, uh, paper, certainly uh, in, the, in this time level, we're not able to look into the uh, details of this discussion, but I uh, would like you to point to our publication to look into it further. And we saw in, in this assessment that in some regions, inclusion of these processes leads to differences in ground for recharge changes of up to 100 millimeter per year. Um, so this is actually pretty huge. Next slide. I again like to point out the limitations of the study because I think it's very important when showing these global maps that first seem very impressive that we know how to interpret these results. And we have a limited amount of GCMs that we used in this study is there are only four global circulation models. We have large uncertainties, not all global hydrology models agree on uh, also how to simulate groundwater recharge on these scales. They're very different. And only we are analyzed the yearly mean. And as Richard correctly pointed out, it uh, makes a huge difference uh, in what having extreme rainfall events, for example, and if you're able to actually simulate them correctly. And we assume uh, stabilized uh, global warming levels also there, um, you have to take it with a grain of salt. Uh, it is a choice in methodology of actually showing the results, um, but um, it is of course correct to point out that uh, stabilized warming level is maybe a concept that is, has its drawbacks. And we are limited in the observations uh, for comparison on the global scale. There are unfortunately not many data sets that allows for 
uh, for a consistent um, co um, uh, comparison on, on, on the global scale. So to conclude, only four out of eight models uh, in this ensemble actually simulate the effect of changing TU2 levels on vegetation, so the change in stomatal, stomatal conductance, and show a possibly very large effect on uh, ground uh, projected ground for retouch change. Retouch in general is most difficult to simulate in GHMs, as, the, as I said, the uncertainties accumulate in, in the water column, and we definitely need to improve these global models to make our assessments better. But I see also uh, a positive side to actually having these numbers because they're at least the best first best guess that we have on the global level. And it could help you, uh, us together with available global groundwater models to improve our understanding of uh, groundwater under climate change. Next slide. I would like to thank my uh, co-authors supporting the study, especially uh, Professor Petra Joll and Dr. Hannes Müller-Schmidt from Frankfurt. Um, and if you want to know more about our center and the global data center supplies low water quality data, also groundwater, please visit our homepage. Thank you very much. Thank you, Robert, for your presentation. That, uh, that's great. That's great. I mean, it's amazing at times to see it at the, at the global scale. And of course, uh, there's all sorts of discussion and debate about uh, um, uh, modeling at different scales. But, um, I, I, you know, I, for one, um, uh, I think that the, the, uh, the efforts to, um, uh, to model at the scale are worthwhile and important. Um, and, um, uh, and so, yeah, look forward to seeing it. There's a long history in your group of modeling at this scale. And so uh, I realize it's always in a way a work in progress, but very good. Um, we will now open the floor uh, to questions from across the panel. We don't have a lot of time, but we're gonna use the time as best we can. So um, Rabina, I was going to hand over to you did you want to um, pose, we have basically all the speakers now become panelists, okay? So we're all in the room together. And I was wondering whether Rabina, you could pick out a few questions that have been asked on the ch in the, uh, the Q&A. And what, by the way, to everyone um, uh, who is listening, the all questions in the Q&A will be put to the authors, okay? We will try and address some of them right now in this live this live session, but do enter your questions because they will all be answered. We will put all questions to all the authors. So Rabino, did you want to start with some questions? And I don't know whether you wanted to identify particular respondents. Yes, thank you very much, um, Professor Taylor. Yes, I'm looking at the Q&A and I will pick out some questions. Um, I'll start with San Hu Chang our first presenter. San, there was a question from uh, Mawan, and it is, what are the main indicators of the impact of climate change to sea water intrusion? The major San? indicator, hi. Sir. Yes, please. Okay, so the major indicator is the salinity data. So it can be, TDS or chlorinated concentration or kind of density. So that shows the third world intrusion as an indicator. So, but however, in my study, I'm using an electrical conductivity as an indicator because the national monitoring network is using the EC data as a, the major indicator in, in this country. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Thank you. very much. Um, <clears throat> okay. Then um, I have a question for this question came in for Simon Craig. Simon, um, in your presentation, you actually showed a section with one well on the center of the island with values of mixed water. Is this only because of the high transmiss transmissivity? of the geology materials, or what could be the possible explanation for this? All right, well, um, if I could see this side, it might help, but I don't remember us doing much um, survey of wells in the center of the island, simply because of how hard the karstic rock is, and all wells on the island are hand dug. 
the wells were done in nearer the yellow and brown sands or in areas very close to that region, yellow and brown sands or on the beach sands in those general vicinities. To the center of the island, there is a, there's a, a surface pond that is, is highly saline and it became saline when it was connected to the sea in the past by a canal. Um, in recent times, they closed off this canal and now there's a lot of still saline waters. And during harsh dry seasons, this pond evaporates and it becomes sometimes dry and they do find salt pans in that area. So if there is, um, it might be a bit of a misunderstanding in that general vicinity, but if I could just get some, some detail on which slide that was, I could probably clear that up. Okay, maybe it's, it's not, may not be possible to actually, because the, the, the person who posed the question didn't clarify the slide, but I think you're, you've, you've tried at least to, to clarify. Um, then the next question goes to Professor Taylor. Oh, yeah, thank you. Um, I was just looking through some of the questions. Perhaps I'll feed one um, for myself. A number of people in the chat room were asking about, while you speak of more intense rainfalls, surely the soil characteristics are going yeah. to play a role in determining infiltration versus runoff. Agreed. Yeah. Agreed. I think the point I would make just to answer that in, in more detail is we need to sometimes be cautious about using matrix based um, uh, soil matrix based properties and recognize that there may be other structures in the soil. What we see is empirical at the moment. Basically, we are seeing um, infiltration velocities that are more rapid than uh, than those that would be estimated from the, uh, the soil matrix itself. So yes, it will control it. And clearly where you have relatively impermeable soils or even you know, hard surfaces, you will get higher uh, runoff. And um, so it's not a universal point. I did use the, the caveat of in many environments, not all, but we are just seeing a rather, uh, it, it's a very consistent signal um, in observing uh, the ability of the, uh, um, of the, of the surface soils to be able to transmit that, whether it is diffuse recharge, meaning it infiltrates at the spot, or whether it's leading to greater uh, focused recharge, uh, which is runoff that is then channeled to a depression or to a river channel. Um, I'll now ask, a, uh, as chair, I'll ask a question to Sergey. It was very interesting, Sergey, your work showing um, that uh, wind speed was having an influence um, in not necessarily the amplifying evapotranspiration. Um, and um, and that, therefore, you were not getting the reductions that you, that might have been anticipated. Many of the dynamics you showed in the European part of Russia look, look similar to the dynamics people have been talking about for the Rocky Mountains in North America. I'm just wondering whether they have also, whether this business about wind speeds and changes in evapotranspiration under climate change is something that you think has been observed in other environments, or is it simply here in the European part of Russia that you have uh, diagnosed this? Maybe, Sergey, you could answer. Thank you for the question. Yes, uh, I see the public, I see the papers uh, where uh, the decreasing of the wind speed uh, in the European part of Russia were absorbed. Uh, but uh, when we when we when we speak about uh, wind speed, uh, we maintain uh, the surface wind speed. Uh, the climatic uh, the, the, the meteorological trends are that uh, the the upper wind speed increased, but the surface wind speed has decreased, and uh, and the data uh, the data confirms that that this I um, I see in in many many papers in Russia, but uh, but, but I not see uh, the data of this in the uh, in the papers uh, in other countries. Thank you for your uh, thank you for your reply, um, Rabina. Did you have another question you wanted to pose? Yes, um, from the group. Yes, there's one question which I wanted to pose actually, Richard. 
Yes, does it come? Do you, do, you, do you know the source of it? You could maybe highlight yes, the person who yes, asked it. Yeah. Yes, the question was about the intensity intensified rainfall events. Um, from your presentation, it's clear that these intensified rainfall events are contributing to increased groundwater recharge. But then the question is, how is this affecting the groundwater quality? I think what we have seen, I think this will depend upon land use and context. So what we've been seeing in um, urban environments is relatively rapid contamination, um, particularly where community hygiene and uh, waste management is not as good as we would desire and um, and that th they provide sources immediately available sources of pollutants associated with either localized runoff and infiltration or 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 or, or larger scale uh, patterns in that way so i think groundwater has historically been considered to be a relatively safe source um, and relatively um, resilient to contamination from um, from surface uh, uh, contaminants, but I think what we're recognizing the the corollary, if you want to pull it, to increase rainfall in, up to the bias towards heavy rainfalls replenishing groundwater is this increased vulnerability, which is so that is the that is the other side of the coin, which is obviously quite uh, a negative um, uh, outcome. Um, in many environments. What it does emphasize, though, is the importance of, of improving community hygiene and, uh, hygiene and waste management to reduce the opportunities or risks associated with this. Have I answered the question, Rabina? Yes. yes Thank you. Richard, Thank you've you. tried. <laughs> yes, you have. I know. I know we don't have Thank much you. time. I yes. did want to ask if it's OK. I didn't see a specific question from the audience uh, uh, associated with Robert's presentation. And maybe He's I wanted to ask. I wanted to ask, a, let's just see whether we... Uh, um, there is. There is. Uh, Brubina, yeah, there can is. you go ahead? Yeah, there is for, for Robert. Um, Robert, um, one of the participants thinks that the uncertainty in future recharge estimation is mostly associated with GCM uncertainty rather than other factors. So, Robert, do you think if... As, a stochastic approach for estimation, if you used it, would it make sense? Yeah, thank you for the question. So, um, of course, we also looked into uh, where the uncertainty comes from. Does it come from GCMs and does it come from the GHMs? And we've seen in other stu studies that then the, G the GCM signal is, is that what we uh, really see as, as a major effect, for uh, for example, for uh, for changes in, in, in runoff and stream flow, but not for groundwater recharge. We actually saw that uh, the uncertainty is in, is in the GHMs. And I, I think it is due to the limited representation of the whole uh, groundwater recharge process and very different implementation across the models. Some of them use a Richards equation. Some of them have a very simplistic soil column, 1D basically. and and the other thing is, of course, uh, errors at up. If we we representing, we're modeling the last step in in, in that whole water column, and uh, I think these are all reasons why we see these large uncertainties, and we do have to uh, improve the models. So um, yeah, I'm I'm quite certain that the uh, the major uh, influence is are the GHMs, but of course, yes, there are of course also uncertainties and changes in rainfall patterns. Uh, but I think for major regions. Uh, we have a large agreement in the models on, on what's going to change, right? I mean, for the Med region, it's pretty clear. For Eastern Africa, it's pretty clear what's going to happen just in, in as a general picture. And I think this is where you can use these large models for to get a general picture of, of how the situation will change. Okay. Of course, not for specific. Thank you, Robert. We're going to have to wrap up this session now. Just, just to wrap, let everybody know in the audience, the second session of theme one will run at 6.30 p.m. Europe, or Central European time today. And then there is a third session that runs at 7, at 8, ooh, uh, 7 a.m. Central European time tomorrow. So uh, we look forward to your participation in all the thematic sessions, but I'm just letting you know where the other presentations under the scene will take place. 
I want to really thank the wonderful chairing that was done by Rabina Kulabako, my colleague here from Makere University in Uganda. Bravo, Rabina. And uh, yeah, we'll see the rest of you online. Okay. Thank you. Bye bye. Okay. Bye bye.